listen to this presentation in French, just go to the bottom of the screen and click the translation button and select French. Si vous voulez écouter le, la présentation en français, appuyez sur le bouton Traduction au bas de la page et sélectionnez Français. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Nuria Bronfman, Executive Director of the Movie Theatre Association of Canada. And I would like to thank Telefilm Canada for being our partner in the study that we are about to present and in today's webinar. Today's presentation was supposed to take place at Show Canada in Yellowknife this year, and it is an update to the study we presented five years ago in Quebec City. It was conducted pre-COVID, and it is a dive into Canadian movie-going habits pre-pandemic, so please keep that in mind as you listen to today's information. Before we get started, I would like to welcome Alisa Sapa, Attaché Corporate Affairs and Industry Relations for Telephone Canada, to say a few words. Thank you, Nuria. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you for your time, for your interest. We really appreciate it. Uh, I wanna give a particular thank you to the team at MTAC. Thank you, Nuria. Thank you, Carrie. We value the continued partnership with you and we appreciate everything that you do for exhibitors, distributors, and of course our producers. Uh, and of course, a big shout out of thanks to the brilliant team at ERM Research led by Gary Faber, who will be leading the conversation today. We love working with the team. This research, this report, we feel provides really valuable business intelligence. It's business intelligence that will shed light into the tastes and preferences of uh, film consumers, in particular, active film consumers. There's a lot of interesting information packed into this research. Um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the presentation. So with that, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Now it is my pleasure to give the floor over to our favorite honorary Canadian, who is also a huge supporter of Show Canada, and we are so thankful for that. President of ERM Research, Gary Faber. Thank you, Noria. All right. Um, nice to be back. Thank you, Lisa, as well, for the kind words. Um, we have a, um, a heck of a presentation to go through to you today. Um, we are, as um, Noria and um, Elisa just mentioned, we're here to present the results of a study that looked at the state of movie going uh, in 2019, which feels like the same thing as presenting a study that looked at the death of the dinosaurs, right? It's such a long time ago. Um, so in a typical world, we would have presented this way back in the spring. Um, and that information at the time really would have been super relevant. But unfortunately, a lot of the world has changed, um, especially in the terms of movie going. Um, so looking at what happened in 2019 seems, as I said, pretty far away. But there's a lot of good news that comes out of this. It's, it's still important, of course, um, to see what was happening and do our best to understand why it was happening. Uh, we also have data back from when we did a similar study um, in 2015. So we'll be comparing to that when it makes sense and see how the industry was changing. Now on the bright side, our timing on this study was uh, excellent. And maybe this is the best way to look at these data. This is a benchmark um, for our next study. Um, as Noria mentioned, we were fortunate when we got this study in basically right under the wire as the pandemic was setting in and theaters were starting to close. Um, and all of this is gonna be incredibly helpful because we have a real point of comparison to come back to next year and see how that pandemic has changed things. Um, if we didn't have this study right now, we'd be forced to compare back to 2014 and 2015 and only be able to make some educated guesses on what was caused by COVID and what was a result of the changing marketplace. So with that in mind, let me go through a little bit about what we have on tap for today. Um, we're going to be breaking down the presentation into four different segments. I'm going to start first. I'll give, before we really get going, I'll give an overview of uh, the research process, just as a quick reminder of that. But then I'm going to get into um, attendance patterns. And here we're going to give a snapshot of uh, how attendance patterns have changed in the last five years, um, how they differ against the Canadian population, and just a basic snapshot of who these moviegoers are. 
Um, from there, and good news today, you're not just going to hear from me. I brought along David and Pauline, um, who many of you know from my team. I'm going to transfer it to David and Pauline at, at the second section, and they're going to talk to us about seeing movies in the theater um, and what drives moviegoers to really want to go to theaters um, these days rather than watch content at home. Um, we're going to stay with David and Pauline for then talking about the flip side of that, watching movies at home. Uh, understanding what the factors are that are uh, swaying moviegoers to maybe some say, uh, some favor um, seeing films at home. And then it'll come back to me um, and I will give a quick summary of uh, the pertinent patterns, uh, hopefully some salient findings um, that will wrap up on the presentation today. After that point, um, we'll see how we're doing on time. Um, and if we have some time left, um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which some of you may see. Um, go ahead and flip off some questions as you go. If we have some time, we can get to your questions. If they're small questions as we go, um, David, Pauline, Peter, and, and the rest of my team is online, um, and we'll do our best to answer them as we go as well. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is we're giving you the highlights today. This is really a highlight reel um, that we are presenting. Uh, we have a much fuller, more robust study um, and that's going to be shared online in the, in the, in the future. And that'll go into a, a little bit more depth than we have time to go into um, today. Um, so let's get started. Let me do a quick little review of the research process. And as you can see from the slide, people are so happy for this part of the presentation. Um, so let's just go ahead and do that. Um, as I mentioned, the study was done in early to mid-April, right as the country was getting settled into the quarantine. We started off by talking to um, 2,600 respondents aged 13 and over, no upper level, level cutoff, um, in both French and in English. And our goal was to target those 22,656 respondents to be representative of, of the Canadian population. That worked out to give us just under 1,900 moviegoers. And the moviegoers were defining as those who saw one or more movies in 2019. And that's who the study is going to focus on today, um, those moviegoers. And with such a large sample, we have a margin of error of plus or minus 2.26 percentage points at a 95% confidence interval. Um, so that's really some nice stable data to discuss. So let's get going. Uh, let's start by looking at attendance patterns. This section will aim to explain who was going to the movies in 2019 and how that compares to the Canadian population overall, as well as hopefully looking at some any significant changes from five years ago. So first up, I wanna look at things by movie going frequency. Okay, on the left, we see a chart. There's a lot to look at here, so I'm gonna break it down slowly. Um, on the left, we see a chart that breaks down the movie going share. So let's start there. The big number in the middle, 77%, that shows you the percentage of all Canadians 13 plus who attended a movie in 2019. 77%. That's a high number. I'm going to show you in a moment. That's actually a higher number than we saw five years ago. That 77% is made up of who we're calling the heavy moviegoers. That is that darker red part of the donuts. They saw 10 or more movies in a theater in 2019. Then we see, and that's 18%. Then we see the moderates. That's the lighter red. That's 38%. This is the largest segment of moviegoers. And finally, the uh, purple color, uh, that's the light moviegoers, those who only saw one or two movies in the theater in 2019. Uh, this color palette will stay throughout the report. So always it's gonna be the red, the darker red is gonna be the heaviest, um, and the purple is gonna be the lightest. This 77% of Canadians who went to a cinema in 2019 equates to just under 25 million unique moviegoers. And when folding in the actual box office, that gets, that, num that gets us that number in the middle. It works out to be 3.0 tickets bought on average by every Canadian in 2019. Now, the one thing to note is that on this chart on the right, go all the way to the right, I wanna show you how important these heavy moviegoers are. So the 18%, the dark right from the left, of all Canadians who went to the movies 10 or more times in 2019 accounted for more than half of all tickets sold in the country, 55% to be exact. It's for that reason we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about them. They're a very important segment and they set the tone on a lot of movie going 
um, as we all um, know and as we'll show you. So let's go ahead and compare these numbers to that where we saw five years ago. Uh, the same thing at the bottom. Uh, the same, it works out the exact same way. When looking at that comparable data, the lower left, 66% is what we saw five years ago. Uh, that's an 11 percentage point increase in 2019. Uh, that is really strong news. It's quite an increase. Um, and it's good news on that front that more people are seeing in theaters um, than before. And by the way, this finding is consistent with what we've seen from the NPA report out of the United States. So it's a whole North American trend on the whole. More people went to the movies. However, on the flip side, the negative part is that 66% back in 2014 and 2015 equated to 3.6 movie tickets purchased per Canadian on average. So that's a significant decline, a decline of 0.6 tic uh, tickets bought per person per capita. Um, this finding is further supported by the data on the lower right. Uh, the heavy moviegoers accounted for a larger portion of tickets back then, um, though there were fewer of them. And now we are seeing the moderates and lights accounting for more tickets than before. So all in all, this is adding up to the fact that more people are going to the movies on a whole, but they they're doing it less often. And we see this from the box office. The higher grossing movies are grossing more. The lower grossing movies are grossing less. Um, this fact is also changing our movie going behavior, um, which we'll get into in a bit. Uh, that fact of going to the movies more but less often is something that we are going to be coming back on a few times today. That, that pattern comes up a lot in the data. Before we dig in further on frequency of movie going, uh, let's make look at the makeup of moviegoers. And for simplicity's sake, we're going to look at these numbers as an index. So what that means is any data point that extends to the right of that 100 line, you see those black lines that drop down uh, under the 100, that represents a segment that over indexes against the Canadian population on the whole. Anything that falls under the 100 or to the left of it uh, under indexes. So let me give you an example, uh, a piece of data not depicted here, um, but it's in the full report. 51% of moviegoers identify as male. Well, just under 50% of the Canadian population is male. So comparing those two numbers shows us that males over index as moviegoers. So that's how that index really kind of works out for us. Using that same analysis on age shows that those under 45, the top four or the darker blue um, lines in that second chart um, makes up a greater proportion of moviegoers um, than compared to the population. In fact, those first two lines, the 13 to 17 year olds and the 18 to 24 year olds really over index significantly, um, a finding that I get hit on more in just a bit. And finally looking at regionality. So there are some pretty dynamic shifts um, of what we saw compared to five years ago. Um, but let's just look at this data first. Those in Ontario, Alberta, and the Eastern provinces, not including any uh, province pulled out here like Ontario and Quebec, over index the most. Um, of course, some of the regionality differences can be explained by theater density in those areas like Manitoba, which may not be as heavily screened as Ontario, for example. Um, just like five years ago, British Columbia continues to be interesting to see it under indexing. Um, certainly softer box office from there as well. Compare this to five years ago, Alberta and Eastern provinces show a very big jump. Um, Ontario was the only province that really over-indexed um, by any significant margin. So now I want to go back and look at the movie-going frequency a little bit more um, and look at the age and gender that we have here, but lay in that movie-going frequency. I know there's a lot of data on these charts, so I'm going to go as slow as I can. Um, the first thing that I'm pulling up here is the composition of moviegoer type by age and gender segment. So just to give you a sense of settling into what we're looking at here is starting all the way on the left. That's the total column. So you'll recognize these numbers if you're paying attention um, from the data a few slides back. Um, that's the 77%, that's what that adds up to, who are moviegoers on the whole. And the colors in that column represent the same colors from that donut chart earlier, their frequency of attending movies. Same exact data from earlier. Now I'm showing it to you by different segment. So going across, we see some interesting stories unfold. Starting with male and female, the columns two and columns three. Uh, there's the data that says males go to the movies more often than females. In fact, 79% of males are moviegoers versus 74% of females. Uh, males are also more likely 
um, to be heavier moviegoers. 22% of males are heavier moviegoers versus 14% of females. Let's move over to the right a little bit more and look at age. And look at that nice, healthy 95% for 13 to 17 year olds. So let that just sink in for a minute. All, of all 13 to 17 year olds, 95% have gone to the movies in 2019. So who are the 5%, right? That's another question. Um, but look at the way to the right, go all the way to the end, and we get to just 60% of those 65 and over are moviegoers. So that's quite a difference. And in fact, it's a pretty smooth decline here. The older you are, the less likely you were to be a moviegoer in 2019. Now we want to look at this even closer though and work in the movie going frequency. The easiest way to do that was to work with movie going per capita, which you remember earlier was 3.0 on average. So now let's look at the per capita by segment and that's that green line that I just drew in there. So a few things jump out. First look at columns two and three and you can see what a few percentage points means in males versus females. Almost one more ticket bought per year by males. 3.4 versus 2.6. But then look over at ages um, and look at the difference between those teams. The segment doing the most, or going the most, 4.6 movies per year on average, um, and those 65 plus is, has more than a two ticket per year difference. But notice the dip in tickets bought per year by the 18 to 24 year olds. I'm circling that so you can see what I'm talking about. Five years ago, we saw a similar dip in that age group, but here we're seeing a much more dramatic shift, especially with the percentage that are heavy in moviegoers. So why the dip? And then why the increase again as they hit 25? Is there something about hitting 20 that you do have more options for going out? Um, more things become available to you, maybe. Um, maybe that movie going isn't as appealing at that age group, or is there something more interesting about the segment? Um, will they return to a higher amount of movie going when they hit 25? Um, was it just an odd year with not enough movies for them? I don't really think so. So this is a segment that's certainly worth keeping an eye on down the road, seeing if they bounce back um, in three or four years, or does this trend of lower, lower movie going among today's 18 to 24 year olds carry out as they age up along the, along the, uh, the graph there? I'm gonna maybe even make that segment a bit more mystifying. I'm gonna show you some other information by age um, and gender. Um, because we haven't been doing the study every single year, uh, we had to rely on moviegoers to tell us how their attendance might have changed versus last year, right? We have the data now to go back five years ago, but we wanna know, you know, what are you feeling? Are you going more or less than the year before? So that was the question we asked here. And starting with the total, 20%, that's the top line there, said their attendance went up compared to 2018. And around the same number said their attendance went down. That's a change of one percentage point well within the margin of error, so we'll call it even, not much changes. However, when looking at the other segments, we see some changes that are more significant. For example, males reported going more to the movies, while those who identify as female say they went slightly less. Let's drop down to ages, the third chunk of charts right there. And I wanna point out these areas of significance, where we see changes in double digits is really what I'm looking for here. You know, when you get to the ages and we're breaking down the sample a little bit finer, we have a larger margin of error. So I'm really looking for two digit changes over here. And the interesting segments at 18 to 24 actually reports a net increase versus 2018. So that's interesting, as do 25 to 34 year olds. While those 55 plus, the bottom two segments generally show a decline. Now, please keep in mind, uh, this question doesn't consider frequency in a specific sense. It's just, did you go more, did you go less? And what did you think? Or, and, and it's based on what you thought. But more importantly, our study only included people who went to the movies in 2019. So anyone who went to the movies in 2018 and didn't go in 2019 wouldn't be reflected in this data. So there is some built-in error with these question types. So all in all, we use these questions as a great tool to compare among segments. And that's really where the interesting thing is. Without a yearly tracking study, it helps to show where the growth and maybe where the contraction is coming from. And here we see that the contraction in the box office um, in the moviegoers is, is clearly coming from those older audiences. So finally, I wanna share one more chart on moviegoing patterns. Um, and this one concerns who goes to the theater and when, or 
based off their preferences of when they want to go to the theater. So we asked moviegoers, when do you prefer going to the movies? Um, what time in a film's release? Um, and this was done on a little bit kind of ulterior motive too, to say, how would that affect if windows shortening and things like that? And we're not going to get into that here, but this does lead its way into giving us some interesting data into that. So what we're going to look at here is a cumulative graph, where each period adds on to the old period. So the numbers cum as you go to the right. You can see it ends with 100% as we add all the periods together. So let me walk you through this a little bit slower. Um, starting all the way on the left. On opening day or night, 6% of heavy moviegoers, that's the dark red line, prefer to go to the movies, while 4% of light and moderates say that's their ideal time to attend. So not a big shift between the two. I mean, obviously 33% higher for the, for the heavies, but pretty close on the numbers we're talking about. But then as we move to the right, we ask in those that said opening day or night plus opening weekend. And then we start to see some movement. So going one step to that right, to opening weekend, we see that almost a third of heavy moviegoers prefer to go to the movies by the time opening weekend is ended, compared to just 12% of light moviegoers. Moderates, like most of the things we're going to show you, are right in the middle. One more step to the right, and we add in the first Tuesday. And we see a medium-sized jump in the heavies, but the moderates nearly double from 15 to 28%. The lights are still basically at home. So I'm not going to jump into what David and Pauline are going to show you about the importance of cost, but that's a little bit hint on that, where the moderates might be holding back from going to the movies a little bit more. There are other reasons, too. Finally, both segments show equal progression from there, with nearly two-thirds of heavy moviegoers preferring to go to the movies before the first week is out. And a vast majority of lights, 70%, preferring to go after opening week. So I'm, attracting, I'm subtracting that 30% who said another time in the first week from the 100%. So 70% of lights are really going week two, three, four, five, and whatever. I don't know if movies, movies don't play week five anymore. Two, three, four or whatever. Um, the heavies are almost completely done by the time the first weekend, uh, by the time the second weekend rolls around. So a few takeaways. First, this is great proof if we really needed it, that heavy moviegoers set the tone on moviegoing, since their preferred timing correlates strongly with box office of wide release films, right? We see most films, wide release, uh, they typically earn a third, if not more, of their box office on opening weekend. Well, there you go. Second, it shows us how often you go to the movies really does define your habits in movie going. Um, and from a marketing standpoint, there is a lot of data just in this one chart alone of how to target your opening based off of getting the heavies early and the less frequency in the lights later. And as David will show us in a few minutes of where heavies and lights get their information about movies, it almost starts to give us a little bit of a clue of when we should use what medium went. What media went. All right, I've given you a lot of information. Um, about who's going to the movies or who was going in 2019. But now let's switch over um, to why they're going to the movies. So here is where I'm going to turn it over to the Pauline and David team uh, to walk us through the story um, of what is appealing about movie theaters. Pauline, tell us what is appealing about movie theaters. I've been stuck in my house for the past six months. What, <laughs> what could possibly be appealing about leaving it? Um, and Certainly go through uh, comparing that experience, why it's still a special experience um, when comparing to the movie going um, at home. Uh, take it away, Pauline. By the way, dynamite transition there, right? Fantastic, Gary. <laughs> um, all right. So thanks, Gary. And hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to walk you through a quick overview of the um, reason moviegoers choose to see movies in the theater. And then David's going to get into the, some of the statistics behind that. So assuming that they have the time and money, many moviegoers actually prefer to see movies in theaters rather than at home. And this is why. Um, the first thing is it's an immersive experience. Um, the most popular reason for seeing a movie in a theater is because of the big screen experience. It's an immersive experience that allows for a greater sense of escapism. And the combination of the big screen and the surround sound, it creates that sort of full immersion, escapist experience. It's, it's really hard to replicate at home. The second reason is the genre makes it worth it. 
So moviegoers think that it's more essential to see a movie in the theatre when it contains extraordinary cinematography or special effects. So it makes sense that there's a greater urgency for seeing action and action adjacent movies or visually impressive movies in a theatre. And moviegoers say that movies with a, a lot of special effects, they just don't shine quite as bright on a small screen at home. Um, the third thing is, is a shared experience. So many feel that the experience of seeing a movie is heightened by sharing it with other people. They enjoy meeting up with friends or making a date night out of a trip to the cinema. And there's sort of two parts to this. One part is about being in the theater with friends and the other part is about being ahead of the curve so that you can see the movie and chat about it with your friends before anyone else. So some moviegoers make a point to see movies in theaters early so they can participate in those pop culture conversations. So new installments and favorite franchises or critics picks draw moviegoers to theaters. They don't want to miss out on something that's culturally important and they want to get in before the spoilers. And this is certainly more the case for heavy moviegoers who go earlier in the run. And the last factor here is star power. So many moviegoers say that a prestigious or favorite actor is something that increases their sense of urgency to see a movie in a theater. Um, there's an assumption that if a renowned actor is featured, then the movie will be high quality and it's worth getting out of your house, going to the theater and paying for the price of admission. So now I'm gonna turn it over to David. I'll let you dig in a bit more to the statistics behind all of this. Awesome, thank you, Pauline. Um, another great transition, I think. <laughs> as we go through the and next- that one wasn't nearly as good as the other one, just so you know. Well, that's where the joke comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so as we go through the next few slides, we'll be digging a bit more into what drives moviegoers to theaters. But first, let's take a minute to look at ways in which moviegoers are learning about new movies in the first place. With heavy moviegoers being represented by the burgundy bars that you see, and the light moviegoers by the purplish gray bars that you see. Um, worth noting, moderate moviegoers who are not represented here all fall somewhere in the middle, regardless of the source of information. So for simplicity's sake, we just left them out of this slide. Um, keep in mind what we're looking at is how often moviegoers use each of these sources to learn about new movies, with the bars being the percentage who said they use each source either very much, or excuse me, very or somewhat often. Now, regardless of whether you see a lot of movies in theaters, whether you see a few movies in theaters, word of mouth is the source of information moviegoers use the most. So that's what you see right there at the top of the chart. Um, it's after word of mouth where we really start to see major differences between those light and heavy movies. So in addition to word of mouth, the heaviest moviegoers turn to trailers at extremely high levels, particularly in theater trailers, which almost matches that word of mouth followed by TV commercials. Now for the light moviegoers, trailers are far less important. In the case of in theater trailers, they're just not in the theaters to see them. So it's TV commercials that are really the source that they're most likely to turn to. And aside from word of mouth, those TV commercials are really the only source where we see about half of that segment approaching um, or saying that they use it at least somewhat often. Now, if we dig a little deeper, we see heavy moviegoers selected on average five and a half sources of information from this list compared to light moviegoers who selected just under three, 2.9 to be exact. Um, just so you know, the list that we presented to respondents was actually a bit longer than what we see here. Twitter, Letterboxd, and Snapchat were all selected at low enough levels that we did not include them here on this slide, but they were included on the list that respondents were presented. Um, and I say that just because those calculations that you see, the 5.5 and 2.9 sources, include that full comprehensive list. Anyway, heavy moviegoers are much more attuned to what is going on in the marketplace. This admittedly is probably intuitive. But what this means is that they can be reached much more easily through a variety of channels, whereas there's no single defined way to reach light moviegoers with movie-related content. So, once moviegoers are armed with the information about new movies, let's talk a little bit more about what drives the decision whether to see new movies in a theater. So we asked the question about which factors or amenities 
are important in whether or not to see a movie in theaters. What you see here is the percentage of moviegoers who say each of them are very or somewhat important in their decision. So we're going to start by just looking at the data from 2019. Here we see moviegoers are driven by comfort, cost, and convenience above all else, and specifically comfortable seating, ticket price, and overall theater quality rank is the top three factors moviegoers consider. So those are the top three factors that you see there at the top of the chart, followed by convenience of location and the availability of convenient parking. Next, about half consider large format screens important, while roughly four in 10 prioritize luxury reclining seats and or the ability to reserve their tickets in advance. Now, when we compare this to what moviegoers told us in 2014, the order has not changed much at all, it really hasn't changed at all. In fact, we see hardly any differences at all within the top tier. And if you just look at those first three factors again, None of them changed by more than a point since 2014. So what's interesting is where we do see an uptick. Um, and when we, when we add in that 2014 data, um, we see that moviegoers are prioritizing amenities that were less synonymous with moviegoing than five years ago. Most notably, the ability to reserve seating online, as you can see in that boxed off area, nearly doubled from 22% in 2014 to 41% in 2019, along with the importance of luxury or reclined seating, so the greatest increases. These trends, they certainly make sense given they're much more widely available than even five years ago. Um, but for what it's worth, we hypothesize that they will continue and maybe even advance coming out of COVID. And we're seeing those same trends now emerge with regards to full service in theater dining and the availability of alcohol. So those are the last two factors that you see at the bottom of the page. Um, for now, they haven't caught on quite as much as the seating options that we've discussed, but it certainly will be interesting uh, to see if moviegoers prioritize them moving forward as they become more wide. So David, I'm gonna jump in here just for a second, because there's one thing that I do wanna point out um, and that is the importance of good restaurants being located nearby. Um, and again, this was done pre-COVID. This wasn't done people fantasizing about going to a restaurant. Um, we found this rather odd at first glance um, because our thinking was if in theater dining is becoming more important, um, wouldn't restaurants nearby then be less important? Um, wouldn't we see that go down? And it wasn't a big 19% wasn't a big number in 2014, 2015, but it's up to 30%, you know, a 33% increase on that. Um, so to make sense of this data, we went back to that very first slide and looked at movie going patterns and all this together um, tells a pretty interesting story. One thing that I want to remind everybody is specifically the fact that we have more people going to the cinemas in 2019, but they're going less often. Uh, remember, they went to 0.6 movies less than they had five years ago on average. Um, that's a very significant drop. And what that means is going to the movies is becoming more of a special event. It's becoming a rarer treat. So with big ticket event movies sucking up a bigger portion of the box office comes more plans made on when to see these movies, which then of course comes more advanced planning, right? You have to, if you want to get a seat on the first weekend. Um, this is then adding up to a trend that movie going is maybe becoming more of a special treat or special event. And the ability to plan an entire evening around going to these movies is becoming even more important. So this is certainly something that we're going to keep an eye on to see how that's really kind of changing out and shifting um, in the future. And it's something that might warrant some more research down the road. Um, but it was an interesting finding for us to see how those, uh, that, that, that kind of jumped up and increased off of that. Now back to you, David, transition. Great, thank you. No, that was definitely one of the questions that we were super interested in when we, when we saw that initially. It was a bit of a head scratcher until we dug. So um, when we started to piece that together, that was, that was really interesting for us as well. Um, so we've talked a little bit about it already, but what is driving all of these changes? Um, and there's a few areas that we'll touch upon, but let's start um, by talking about barriers to attendance. So again, we asked moviegoers which factors were very or somewhat important in their decision whether or not to see a movie in theaters. And what we see here are the barriers to greater attendance. With light moviegoers represented in the purplish gray color again, moderates in that lighter burgundy in the middle, and the heaviest moviegoers in darker blue. Um, now within each segment, cost is the biggest barrier to greater attendance, and anytime we ask a question like this, we see that being the case. 
But when we start to analyze the differences by segment, we really start to see an interesting story. emerge. So looking at the lightest moviegoers first, over half indicate they simply prefer to watch movies at home. That's that 54% that you see. So while cost is the biggest barrier, just getting them off the couch isn't very far behind. They have plenty of options to choose from at home that they're happy with already. On the flip side, heavy moviegoers, again in that darker burgundy, say there just aren't enough movies that they want to see in theaters, that they would go to theaters more often if there was more content that they were interested in seeing. And so in some ways you can argue that streaming movies at home is actually filling a gap for many of them. Lastly, the moderate moviegoers were really interesting to us. So in general, we see a pattern in which these barriers are greatest for the light moviegoers, uh, smallest for the heavy moviegoers, and moderates fall somewhere in the middle. But the question that we had was how this would play out when thinking about um, whether they fall more in line with the lights, who prefer to watch movies at home, or the heavies, who wish there was even more movies that they wanted to see in theaters. And the good news, at least from our point of view, is that they're much more like the heavies. And in fact, if you look at that boxed area, you'll see the same number of both heavies and moderate moviegoers. So 43 and 44% respectively have indicated there just aren't enough movies they want to see in theaters. Like the heavy moviegoers, they want to see more in theaters. Uh, they just can't find enough content that they want to see. So we do see some opportunity there. Now, one barrier we haven't touched upon yet is about a quarter of moviegoers feel that only certain movies need to be seen in the theater which we'll talk about in a bit more depth on the next page. And here on the next page, we asked everyone two questions. So the first- Hey, is, hey David, you're unfortunate, your audio is cutting out a bit. Um, oh. So I don't know if there's a, everything's okay, no fires out there? Nope, well, not, not that close. They've, All they've right, been... so I'll, I'll go ahead and just take this slide then if that's okay, no, um, no just to make sure we keep that moving. Um, what David was going to tell you here is that he's picking up, uh, we're picking up into talking about the, um, the types of, we want to talk about the favorite genres to see in a theater. So we asked everybody a few questions, uh, or many questions, as you can see. Um, first, we asked, what are your favorite genres to see in a the theater? And that's what the blue bars that you indicate here, that you see here. It's the percentage that say they very much or somewhat enjoy seeing each of these genres in a movie theater. So comedies are the favorite, followed closely by action. Comedies, 90%, action, 87%. Close behind them, thrillers and dramas. And one tier below them, you see your sci-fi, your romantic comedies, your superheroes, and your animated movies. Then we ask them, what are the most important genres to see in a theater? And that's what I'm putting up right here. Now, here you're seeing the percentage who said that that is an important um, genre to see in a theater. And what's interesting is how the order has switched quite a bit. For example, while 90% of moviegoers are fans of comedy, just 20% of moviegoers say it's important to see them in theaters. So that means you're talking about 23% of comedy fans saying comedies need to be seen in a theater. That's just dividing the 20% by the 90%. So this 23% actually falls in the bottom half of all genres. By contrast, let's look at action. 49% uh, of say that action fans are a must see in theaters. So you're talking about 57% then of action fans say action is one of the most important genres to see in a theater. Um, you see similar trends by other genres like sci-fi, superhero fans, you see the pops in there in the same kind of way. And this goes a long way to explaining why we are all conditioned that event movies make up such or need to be seen on the big screen as Pauline has already told us and why they make up such a big chunk of the box office, of course. So now that we've spent some time talking about what moviegoers are looking for out of the moviegoing experience, we're gonna get Pauline back on here. Hopefully her audio is working. I hope so. Her yeah. video is, that's good. Um, and um, Pauline, why don't you take it and talk to us a little bit more about how moviegoers are watching movies at home. Okay, so we talked about the pros and cons of going to movie theaters. So let's focus on some of the top reasons why moviegoers decide to stay home and watch the movies. 
So I think it's really important to remember that the study was conducted in April. And so that was just at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and we know that things have changed uh, even more uh, since then. But in that moment of time, here's why moviegoers sometimes chose to see movies at home instead of going to the theater. So the first one is something that David's already pointed out is that movie going can be costly. Um, some moviegoers feel that going to the movies is too expensive to make a habit of it. Um, instead, they wait to rent or stream movies when they become available at home. Gary, we lost the slide, no? Well, oh. you want everything to work without a glitch? Come on. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, all right, so this, um, as I was saying, and also when you think about the cost for parents, the cost of finding childcare is also often a factor in their decision-making process. Um, so I guess the key thing is for some moviegoers, what, because of the cost, because of coordinating, you know, everything, going to the cinema becomes much more of a special occasion. So the second point is that staying at home is more convenient. You know, watching a movie at home just allow us, allows for much more flexibility. People can pause and rewind whenever they want so they can go grab a snack or take a break and they're not going to miss any of the movie action. Um, they also can see their movies whenever they want when they're at home. It's very convenient. They're not limited by the movie show times. They can just see them whenever they want. The third point is they get access to a broader range of content. Some moviegoers are not particularly interested in the kinds of movies and franchises that are currently hitting theaters. So without enticing content, some moviegoers, just, they just don't feel the need to commit so much time and money when you know, streaming is easier. It allows them access to more, more content and more variation of content. And the last thing is that crowds can be unappealing. So even before COVID-19, some moviegoers felt that watching a movie in a packed theater with people eating their concessions, just it was not their cup of tea. It was unappealing. And so people who find large crowds to be irritating, are much more inclined to wait uh, for those later in the run or wait to see those movies become accessible at home. And, and we know that now in the post-COVID world, there's a whole nother layer to this crowd uh, issue. Anyway, let's um, have a look specifically at the impact of streaming on moviegoers. Um, the fact is that 67% of moviegoers stream movies at home. And the top platforms, you have around six out of 10 going to Netflix. Uh, at lower levels, around three out of 10 uh, stream content from Amazon Prime Video and around one out of, uh, two out, no, a fifth, 20% uh, go to Disney Plus. Um, so we asked people, you know, how do you feel about what, what impacts does streaming, streaming have on your movie going? And you know, on the right here, you're going to see some statements uh, about what people said and how it impacts their movie going. So most moviegoers right at the top there agree that streaming has allowed them to see more movies in general. They get to see more movies. That's the top thing. Secondly, three quarters feel that it has expanded their repertoire. So it's introduced them to genres they would not typically see in a theater. And seven out of 10 feel that streaming enables them to access films that might not be playing at their local theaters. So it's an access issue. But unfortunately, down the bottom there, you'll see that over half also agree that streaming has made them less likely to see movies in theaters. So it may have increased their overall movie consumption and broadened their tastes and their repertoire and given them access to things that they that might not be playing locally, but it has also eroded their likelihood of seeing movies theatrically. And another thing just to keep in mind is these are the people who are moviegoers. You know, we didn't talk to people who didn't see movies in 2019. So it kind of remains to be seen how streaming has impacted their moviegoing. Um, anyway, Gary, let me turn it back to you to sum all of this up. All right. Thanks, Pauline. Thanks, David. Um, great job walking through the story um, and staying on schedule. So I think you're all better at that than I am. Um, all right. So a lot of information. Again, this was a highlight report. 
Um, you know, the goal was to give you the highlights and the key takeaways, um, just things to think about. And then when that full report does come out a little bit later on, um, there's, there's more data in there, including the data that Pauline talked about, about who is streaming where. Um, but let's go ahead and try to wrap this up with six key uh, takeaways uh, in case you join late. So here you go. Um, so number one, attendance is up, but frequency is down. Um, while self-reported moviegoing attendance in 2019 has increased uh, versus five years ago, the frequency of moviegoing is lower, um, which results in a box office that's relatively static um, when comparing that back. This lower frequency of the attending, though, is making the moviegoing experience more special, um, and it seems to be making it into more of an event, where moviegoers are more likely to consider going to the movies as part of a full evening's plan as opposed to maybe a last-minute decision. Number two, ticket sales trend younger and to those who identify as males, um, consistent with the large event movies that are dominating the box office. Uh, males purchase roughly one more ticket than females per capita. And those aged 13 to 44 are the most frequent attendees with each age segment under 45 buying at least three tickets per capita in 2019. Now fold in points one and two, and we see that the heaviest moviegoers are really driving ticket sales. They're the ones that are coming the earliest in the runs. They're the ones that are seeing the movies that they feel there's enough to see. Um, and they are really dominating, um, making up a majority of the tickets sold in the country. Uh, as Pauline and Davis showed us, uh, moviegoers still prefer the immersive experience of a movie theater. It's, it's one of the big selling points about why I go to the theater. The most important movies to them to see in a theater are those that make extensive use of special effects, action, superheroes, sci-fi, um, even though there are other movie genres that they enjoy better. Um, as an aside, and what ties into some other work that we've done, Davis or I showed you those large amount of comedy fans. Um, and we truly believe that that's a key reason why we're seeing those large action films um, that do an effective job of rolling in comedy, like pretty much the whole latter half of the MCU, um, do so well, is it fills that comedy need, um, but with an excuse of a reason to see it on the big screen. Um, when choosing a theater, cost, comfort, quality, and convenience are absolutely key. Uh, certain features such as reserved or luxury seating have become an even more sought out and important part of the experience. Again, that's a trend that is still only under a third, but we're expecting that to really trend upwards. Um, as uh, the years progress. In theater, dining and alcohol is on the way up, but as David showed us, it has yet to hit a threshold of being super important. Um, but a lot of that can have to do with the younger set of moviegoers who maybe can't take advantage of alcohol or don't deem eating while you're dining, uh, while you're watching a movie that important. Um, and finally, let's talk about watching movies at home. Uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, the heaviest moviegoers see streaming as a supplement to their movie viewing. Uh, Pauline said it really well that it brought in their appreciation for different genres. It's a way to be introduced to new filmmakers. Um, it's a complement to the movie going experience. However, light and moderate moviegoers are more likely to see at-home viewing as a replacement. I hate to use that word for the theatrical experience. And we didn't talk to the 23% who don't see movies in 2019 to see how many of them don't go because of streaming. So a lot certainly to chew on um, at this point. Nori, Carrie, I think we have some time for questions. I don't know if we have any questions. Um, and use that Q&A feature if you haven't already, or you can use it just to say hi or heckle us now that we're done. Uh, that's totally fine too. Um, Nori, Carrie, do we have time? We do have time, Gary. Um, and I think there are a few questions. I know some have been um, answered already, but uh, we absolutely do have some time. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm looking right now. This is when I get to play like talk show host. Um, all right, this question comes from um, actually Peter on our team did a great job of answering these questions. Let's see what's open here. We have a question about significant differences in French Quebec. Um, yeah, so when you see the report, you'll, we'll, we're going to touch on a little bit of that on some of the differences in there. Um, there are some subtle differences that you can always reach out. We can get into it as well in terms of types of films. Um, and preference of films and importance of amenities in there as well. So certainly we can do some follow-up and give you some more information on that. And that's all the questions we have. <laughs> Here's a question about 
preferences around show times. We didn't get into that on the study, um, but that is a really interesting thing to um, look at in the future for sure. Margaret said hi. That's a good question. Hi, Margaret. Nobody else said hi. Carrie, we're not seeing a lot of other stuff come in here. They're just little questions, which I love. Full report, Carrie, you'll talk about when that will be available, right? Yes, we Jeff, will. Jeff Null, uh, hey Jeff. Um, you had a question about concessions uh, choices in the future. Um, that is an interesting one to discuss. So we've done a lot lots of work on concessions for movie theaters. Um, so we certainly can talk about that, but believe it or not, it is extremely regional, um, depending on what different audiences are looking for. Um, so nothing uh, that we have that would look at uh, on a national level. Um, and then Bill here has a question on how frequency is adjusted in the self-reporting data. Um, yeah, Bill, I saw your question earlier. So, all right, so let's get into this one because this is a fun one. So Bill asked a question, um, if you total the data, how many manual, annual emissions would this data suggest? Wondering how overstated the self-reported frequency might be. So this is the dirty secret of any research that you do is people always report higher data. Uh, high, they, they say they do things much more often than they think that they do things. Um, so you're absolutely right, Bill, to ask that question. Um, we use a methodology where we know how many tickets were sold in Canada, and then we balance the data down to that. So we actually bring everything down. I think on average, people overreported by about 15 to 20%, which is completely consistent with no matter what we ask. We can ask people how many times you eat a day, and people will be like, four, four meals a day, even though, they, no, I'm kidding, anyone say that. Everybody knows it's three meals a day. But the point is that people always overestimate on, um, on average. So I think hopefully that answers that question for you. Um, should I keep going? That's a yes. All right. Um, judging by the number of participants, this is really intriguing stuff as everybody drops off. But I'll keep going. Um, do we think Avengers coming out in 2019 rigged the study at all? Um, no, but I think that rigged the movie going. Um, that's the way I'll say that, is that I think that that's why you saw such a large amount of people that came to the theater just one time or just two times um, and why you saw such a large percentage of the, of the population that went to the movies compared to before. So I do think that was one of the things that kind of pumped that up a little bit more. I think that's it on the other one stuff. Um, Nicola is asking a question on conducting a follow-up to gain consumer safety. Carrie, Nori, I know we've talked about that a few times. Um, for sure. Um, so there's a lot of good questions off of that front. So there's a lot of really good questions here, but I think some of the stuff is just going into a little bit more of a um, food for thought than um, answering maybe specific questions about the report. So I think it's a good time to throw it back to you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I want to say thank you to you and Pauline and David. As always, you did a tremendous job and we really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone coming on today. Uh, we will be sending out uh, an email in the next 24 hours with a link to this uh, webinar as well as to the study. And if, we'll look at the questions and if there are any that we can, uh, we can answer, we will um, get back to you with some answers on, uh, on the ones that we didn't get to today. So thanks once again, everyone. And we hope to see you very soon. Uh, either here or hopefully in person. So thank you and have a great afternoon.